Good morning, Mr Beckett. Good morning. Uh, Your Honour, I call John Hunt. Mr Hunt, you're indicating you want to take the, Indeed, take the oath. Could you repeat after me, please? I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence that I shall give in this royal commission in this royal commission shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Place Thank the you. Bible and take a seat, please. Pastor Hunt, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission. John Charles Hunt. <coughs> and uh, you've given your address to the Royal Commission. That's correct. And uh, your current occupation is a Minister of Religion. That's correct. And uh, you've provided two statements to the Royal Commission. Two statements? Oh, no, uh, sorry, no, I'm confusing you with Mr Alcor. <coughs> sorry. Uh, I withdraw that. You've provided one statement dated the 29th of September 2014. That's correct. Yes. And um, are there any amendments to that statement that you wish to make? No, there's not, sir. Is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, indeed. I tender the statement. 18.0037. Now, Pastor, how long have you been a pastor within the Assemblies of God and Australian Christian Churches movement? Since 1987. And um, you're currently the... Uh, the State President of the Australian Christian Churches, is that right? In Queensland, that's correct. And um, when did you assume that position? In October of the year 2010. And prior to that, had you been a member of the State Executive of the ACC in Queensland? Yes, I had. From what years? Um, uh, from, from memory, from October 2002. And as I understand it, you were on the state executive when the credentials of um, youth pastor Jonathan Baldwin were suspended. Is that correct? That would be correct. And uh, you were also on the on the state executive when uh, Mr. Svensson. In fact, I think you were present by that stage um, when Mr. Svensson was tasked with um, investigating what had happened. Indeed, with the. Um, the uh, child sexual abuse allegations against Mr Baldwin. That is correct. Yes, and the way in which um, communication had occurred or not occurred Indeed. with um, ALA and his family, is that right? That is correct. Yes, and you received that report? Yes, that is correct. Um, just some background um, that um, would assist the Royal Commission. Um, Jonathan Baldwin came across from South Australia to the Sunshine Coast in um, 2004 and was appointed by Senior Pastor Ian Lehman to the position of Youth Minister at that church. Are you able to assist us with when he was first credentialed? as uh, a minister of any sort within the Assemblies of God? There is a date. <coughs> um, it, the date would be in 2007. Um, the, the month, uh, I could uh, check, check the record. I, I, I don't have it in my memory. July would be a... Sorry, I, I, shortly, yeah. shortly before you commenced yeah. giving evidence, I understand um, yeah, I did, you yes. made some steps to... To that's check correct. the national yes, that's correct. Uh, the database. That's correct. And I did take a note. And um, the note that's been provided to me, I'll just ask you whether this is correct yeah. or not, was that he was first credentialed on the 14th of July 2005. 2005. He was charged okay. in he was charged right. in okay. 2007. Well, <clears throat> that would be correct then, yeah. All right. And are you able to assist us with um, what credential he held in the period prior to that, particularly 2004 and the first half of 2005? To my understanding, there would be, would be no credential held prior to the, um, uh, 
after the presentation of his PMC, which was, as you just pointed, in July 2005. All right. Um, is it possible that he held a credential from South Australia, which he brought with him, to practice as a pastor in it's Queensland? It's possible, but I'm unaware of that. And, and, and it would be most likely would appear in our database, and I've checked it within the last 30 minutes and it didn't state that was the case. All right. What was... If he had been credentialed in South Australia, mm -hmm. would you expect that to be recorded on the, on yes. the database? Yes, absolutely. All right. What's the process by which, the, during that period, 2004 and onwards, the state executive of the ACC monitors the credentials of those who are ministering in ACC churches? Okay. So <clears throat> the ACC in Queensland is broken up into 14 regions. Um, at the conclusion of, of a calendar year, the regional leaders are contacted by the state office and provided with a list of those credentials within their region and asked to endorse the fact that that list is current. So in other words, we are checking to make sure the people who we have on are still indeed there performing their duties. Um, that would be the, um, uh, the, the official, I guess, mechanism whereby we, we would track where our credential holders are at. Right. Are you able to assist us as to um, why it appears uh, Ian Baldwin was able to minister as a youth pastor from 2004 through to sure. July 2005, certainly. apparently without a credential? Yes, certainly. Um, <coughs> the way the, the system functions is that um, positions within the context of a local church are very much at the discretion of the senior pastor. And there would be nowhere in any of our documentation that would require anybody under the, uh, the, the covering of that senior pastor to hold a credential to fulfil any role that that senior pastor indeed might appoint that individual to. Um, so it's, it's, it's clearly possible, as it would be today, that um, there are numerous volunteers within the context of a local church, and those volunteers are under the covering, as far as we are concerned, of that senior pastor, and he appoints people to positions and removes them from, from positions as he sees fit. So it is imminently possible that um, uh, that Baldwin was functioning as some kind of uh, youth uh, leader, dash minister, however you wish to describe it, within the context of that local church. It's purely the discretion of the senior pastor. It has there is no uh, implication to the movement at all. Um, so, as I understand it then, certainly senior ministers are required to be credentialed. Is, is that, first of all, correct within an yes. ACC-affiliated church? Well, if, if this is a what we would call a registered church, right, yes. then the registered church has to have an OMC holder at the helm. Yes. And if for some reason, uh, you know, sickness, etc., etc., that that wasn't the case, then uh, that would then be assigned to the regional leader to give some kind of oversight to that particular assembly until an OMC holder can be found. Yes. All right, so at the next level, underneath the OMC holder, yeah. and I should establish that uh, that was Pastor Lehman... That's correct. ..2004 to 2006, and then Pastor Peterson That's after correct. that. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And they both held OMCs. That's correct. All right. Uh, but below that, any associate or assistant pastor or youth pastor didn't necessarily... No. Uh, ..wasn't necessarily required to have some form of credential? No. All right. And pastor Hunter, is that even even to call himself a youth pastor? He doesn't need a credential? <laughs> um, I would argue that he couldn't, but there would be nothing stopping him, um, you know, adopting a title that he wished and indeed a title bestowed upon him by the senior pastor. So I would suggest to traditionally not, but again, I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, respond on behalf of all of you know, the various churches in our network. So there's nothing in your code of conduct or rules or, or requirements for affiliation of the church that prohibit the use of the title pastor implying that person holds credentials? Not that I'm aware of, no. Thanks, Mr. 
Thank you. Now, uh, Pastor Hunt, I want to ask you some just some general questions, really, about the the way in which the the ACC works. And I appreciate you're the state president, not the national president, and um, I will have the opportunity later this morning to ask Pastor Alcorn some similar questions. But um, if you could just go with me on these. First of all, um, it's correct to say that the ACC holds itself out as a national movement. That's correct. Yes. Um, and that it, I think you say in your statement that there are over 250,000 constituents. I don't think that was my statement, but I do believe that to be correct. Right. I think uh, Pastor Alcorn, in fact, has given us that yes. figure, but you don't quibble with that. No, not at all. And the fact that it's about 1,000 churches or so. That's that correct. Are, are uh, members of the ACC nationwide. That's correct. Yes, and how many in Queensland? Approximately 300. Um, and the way it works from a, a financial point of view is that those constituents c contribute an amount of money to each of the each of the churches or to the ACC. How does how does financially that system work? If you don't mind. Certainly, um, I'm not clear to your to your question. Um, are you wanting to know how a state um, body receives its, where it gets its, its funding from? All right, well, let's start at the bottom then. How, in this case, the Sunshine Coast Church, um, how did they obtain funds to um, operate? Sure. Um, free, will, free will donations from the people who attend. Right, all right. And there's been some discussion about the old term, a tithe. Yes. Um, is that something that's uh, a percentage of pe of uh, of uh, a congregant's salary is contributed to the church? Is that common, or is that? Um, I would suggest it's probably uh, less common than it might have once been, but yes. I'm sure there are still people who practice that. Yeah. All right. And so the the funding is the funding for the local church for the Sunshine Coast Church is yes. generally drawn from those people who attend the church. I would suggest exclusively right across the board. That's the way it works. Yes. Then, if we go up to the next level, mm -hmm. how is the state executive and the functions it performs funded? There is a, a small percentage, 1.5 per cent, of the funds that a particular uh, church affiliated with us receives from free will offerings, as opposed to offerings that they might receive um, for a specific purpose. So, offerings that are given for a specific purpose attract no 1.5% levy. So it might be for building or for a mission or, or some such nature. Those funds are 100% directed towards the, the proposed um, mission. But, uh, um, but, but a, general, a general offering, 1.5% uh, of that is forwarded on to the state body uh, so it can perform its duties. All right. And then um, what about at the national level? How is that funded? Well, I believe 1%, I, I think, is forwarded on to the national. 1% of what? 1% of that uh, that general uh, tithes and free will offerings at the local church. All right. Does it go straight from the local church up to the national yes. church? Y yes. Not via the... No. All right. So does that mean there's a total of 2.5%? Yes, that would be correct that comes from free will offerings and tithes. Yes. Yes. 1.5% of we, 1 goes. goes to the state yes. and 1% goes to the national body. Yes. Right. And, and I, I would need that 1% confirmed. It might be 1.25. I'm, I'm not exactly sure not being the national president, but it's around 1%. Now, th there's been some evidence, particularly the ALA's family in this case, they moved from uh, another North Queensland town down to, down to the Sunshine Coast. They left... Uh, an ACC church or an Assemblies of God church there and moved down and started to worship at a Sunshine Coast <coughs> church which was affiliated with the ACC. Um, is, the, is the process that um, you're automatically a member of that new church that you moved to or how does... What's the association? That yeah, again, each um, independent, uh, if you will, or autonomous church has its own constitution. Uh, whereby it receives members and, and what that member therefore uh, represents. Um, I would suggest in this day and age there is no automatic transfer of membership. Uh, it may happen in, in an obscure uh, case, but, but more and more um, the constituents of our churches are less and less likely 
to become what one might define as official members and merely attend a, uh, a, a group that they feel um, a, a, a sense of affiliation with. Yes. Um, but would you accept that there's a, a degree of movement of congregants, say, for example, they, they move from Brisbane up to Cairns, for example, that a lot of people who are at an ACC church in Brisbane yeah. would then move to Cairns and go to an ACC church Yeah, I would accept that Cairns. proposition, yes. clearly. And what about if you're on holidays? So you're, you live in Brisbane, you're a member of the local ACC church, yeah. you travel up to Cairns, it's a Sunday, yeah. you want to go to church, you want to go to a local service... Yeah. Um, there's nothing prohibiting that person from turning course, up at an ACC church, is Of course there? not. Our Sunday services are, are open services that any, every and anybody is, is fundamentally welcome to attend at, at a general rule. All right. Um, now, you've heard uh, quite a bit of evidence in the last two days, uh, particularly from Pastors Lehman and Peterson, about the, the state of child protection policies at the Sunshine Coast Church. Yes, indeed. Yes. And um, the evidence, I think, from Pastor Lehman was that um, while he, um, there may have been some unwritten pol policy or he may have had an idea about what to do with allegations of child sexual abuse, there was no written policy until 2006. Did you hear that evidence? I did hear that evidence. And then from 2006 onwards, um, there was a child abuse policy and I took Pastor Peterson to that and I'll ask you some questions about that in a moment. But um, so you'd accept that um, the way in which the state operates in child protection matters is that it certainly it's involved in accrediting both the churches and also accrediting pastors in, in terms of providing them with credentials. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. All right. Um, and then those churches and pastors are able to hold themselves out as affiliated to and credentialed by the Indeed. Australian Christian churches. Indeed. And um, the state and, indeed, the national body has accepted as one of its responsibilities to assist uh, the various levels of the organisation, but particularly at the individual church level, by providing them with... Um, detailed child protection policies, would yes, that be correct? correct? And obviously those policies are aimed at protecting children. Clearly. And assisting those churches with um, uh, undertaking their responsibilities to children as well. Absolutely. Yes. And um, the the policy we have, um, the ones that are in the, that have been tendered before the Royal Commission, there's a 2008 policy. Yes. And then the 2013 policies and procedures, is that right? Yes, correct. And that 2008 policy is very is, is quite a large and detailed document, if I might say so. Right. Would you agree with that? Yes. And that was compiled on the basis of the best evidence and advice that you could obtain? Indeed. For that? Quite a, um, a robust process. Yes. And um, within it includes, so for example, the legislative requirements under Queensland law. Indeed. Um, as well as detailed, protect, uh, detailed provisions for the protection of children based upon other documentation available earlier within the ACC, but also outside the ACC. Certainly. Yes, all right. Now, um, and then we heard some further evidence yesterday, I think particularly from uh, Pastor Svensson, about the process of implementation of those policies. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, if I can summarise it this way, I think that they that involved um, um, seminars at state conferences, for example. Yes. Um, some travelling seminars. I think there it, were indeed two on the Sunshine yeah. Coast about and, that. And probably more um, to the point was the travelling seminars because they were pursuing particularly to these matters. Yes. And held out by us in, in, as the highest importance. All right. Um, and then I think there are some other communications via the, by the newsletter and later yes. via the website. Is that's that right? Correct. Yes, that's All right. right. Now, do I understand that the, that the process is that um, 
what those who work with licensing bodies and so forth um, within government, for example, the, the next step appears to be absent. I want to ask you about that. Right. In other words, it doesn't seem to be um, a process of auditing of individual churches. Would that be reasonable that, that, to that say? That would be fair to say. Yeah, yeah I accept the point. And um, there's also not a process of compliance. That is to say, saying to a local church, have you adopted child protection policies of the standard that we have recommended? There would be nothing in our documentation that would demand a church uh, adhere to the policies that we have recommended or else face um, disassociation. That would be true. And um, all right. And so, as a result of that, there's there's no m matching of sorry. There's no assessment of those individual church policies against the standard that has been adopted at the state level That's by you. Correct. Yes. And the further step, there's no process of sanction, is there? of an individual church if they have failed to adopt a policy. You are correct. Um, yes, thank you. And the reason for that, I think, has been stated a number of times, and that is that there's a process by which... Uh, oh, sorry, I withdraw that. And that's because there's the structure of the ACC is such that those individual churches are treated as independent and autonomous. That is correct. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Now, so can you can you see that some may be critical of the ACC because even though it has adopted a very detailed um, and robust policy, according to what you say, it doesn't seem to have been in certain cases implemented at a, a local church level. I would accept that that that, um, that is an ambiguity of the structure that we have inherited completely. Um, so just... Yeah, so it's an ambiguity. It isn't an ambiguity that you at the state level have addressed as to ways in which perhaps these child protection policies could be better enforced at the local level? No, because um, we have no power to do so. You, you know, we're now referring to the fundamental structure of the organisation, which is a fellowship of autonomous independent churches. The, really, the only uh, body that could address that would be the national one, and ultimately not even the national executive, but only the national conference, uh, because that would, I, I imagine, would require a fundamental change to, uh, to who we are in terms of our structure. Um, it, it's certainly, I mean, we have discussed it and, you know, we have thought, you know, that this indeed um, does need to be examined and, and uh, you know, and, and pursued. Um, but it is, it is clearly a matter for the National Conference uh, to change the structure of the movement. All right, can I suggest to you um, uh, there may be some... Uh, there may be two measures, and I'll certainly raise this with uh, Pastor Alcon when he gives his evidence as well. Um, there are two. There are two powers that are um, exercised by the ACC at the state and at the national level, and that is first of all the credentialing of pastors, correct, and also the affiliation of churches. Correct. Um, has it been considered whether the adoption of child protection policies in line with those recommended by the ACC be required first of a church before it achieves affiliation or keeps its affiliation? Yeah. Um, the idea exists in people's minds, there's no doubt of that. And uh, uh, how then you would uh, take what the current situation is and bring it to that would be a, a decision, I imagine, firstly for the, for the national and then secondly uh, an understanding of the legal process concerning <coughs> how we would then um, enforce that 
legally uh, with, a, with a church that already has affiliation. Um, because at this point in time, that affil that there, is no, uh, there is no review of that affiliation provided that you are maintaining um, what would be the, the, national, uh, the national bylaws, the national constitution. So if a, a church, for instance, deviated from those, then that would be a mechanism that could disassociate that church. At this point, those policies do not exist uh, as, as a mandatory part of that. It's more to do with things along the line of doctrine, uh, historically, in our movement, that would be the case. Now, are we up for a discussion concerning what the idea that you're putting forward? I would say absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Had, had you considered it before um, before yes. preparing for the Royal Commission? Absolutely. And what, what had you done to implement that consideration? Well, I, I have done nothing um, uh, other than have discussions with various um, individuals who I talk with as a, you know, I wonder if we, if the movement will eventually head this way. Um, I can see the need for it, but I'm, uh, I, I think um, situations like this will help us, frankly. All right, just there. All right. So, Pastor Hunt, just, sorry, just to be clear on The cause, well, perhaps I'll ask you, what would cause a dis um, the ACC to disassociate yeah. an affiliated church? Yeah. Uh, um, a constant refusal to um, pay uh, the, what's called the dues, which is the one and a half percent. So, uh, but that wouldn't be to probably for many years. Yeah. Uh, There'd be grace given there. Why? How can we help? You know, please come forward, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If after an extended amount of years um, that church just refuses to be financial with the organisation, then then I think we'd be left with no other option but to say, "Look, I'm sorry, but we are this uh, disassociating you from our from our organisation." Yeah. Um, another mechanism would be. If you refused, as a registered assembly, to have an OMC holder at the helm of that church, for example, if we um, discipline an OMC holder on the basis of a code of conduct breach, and that that credential was suspended, uh, and that church refused to dismiss that person, in other words, they continued to to pay him and and allow him to use their facilities, et cetera, et cetera. On that basis, we would dis, uh, disaffiliate that church. Um, uh, I can't think of any other. I thought you mentioned in answer to one of Mr Beckett's questions that you touched upon doctrinal differences. Right, OK, yeah, thank you for that. The doctrinal differences would be tied up in the teaching of the senior pastor. So the doctrinal issue would be more to do with the credentialing of the senior pastor. So if that senior pastor was teaching doctrinal issues uh, that were in, incongruent with our movement, that senior pastor's credential would be removed. And if that church uh, refused to dismiss him and said, well, we don't care what you say, we're going to continue it, we, we, we adopt this line of thinking, then that would become the mechanism. So it still, it, it still comes back to uh, them maintaining that uh, particular individual despite the fact that he has been decredentialed from the movement. All right, so they're, they're um, examples of what you've given, uh, the examples that you've given are the basis upon which a church would be disaffiliated or dissociated, yes. but not, as you've indicated to Mr Beckett, for um, failing to adopt the child protection that's, policies. That's correct. Because that is not something that is contained in the ACC constitution, is that yes, that's correct. Correctly understood that. Yes, that's correct. And, and, but what I also understand is that that's now actively under consideration. Well, we, as to whether or not there should be a constitutional uh, change. Certainly, madam. Certainly. Sorry.
Thank you, Your Honour. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, there's a, a ministerial code of conduct which, uh, which is imposed upon all credentialed ministers. That's is that correct? correct? And um, as we know, one of, one of the parts of the code is to not engage in any sexual abuse of children. Clearly. And um, a breach of that code then, of course, triggers or even an allegation triggers the, the grievance procedure under the administration manual. Is that correct? Clearly. Yes. Yes. And also, do, do I take it that, um, that it ministerial code, I, I have that brought up, it's tab 52 of the second volume of the policies and procedures, and it breaks matters down into prohibited conduct and conduct to be cautious about. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you'll need to say yes. No, I'm sorry, yes. All right. And sexual behaviour, for example, uh, all inappropriate sexual behaviour is, is prohibited for, with respect to children. That's page four, or ringtail eight zero. Then there are other matters, financial matters, confidentiality, ministerial development, conflicts of interest. They're all covered in, in that code of conduct, aren't they? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Now, is this uh, the ministerial code of conduct uh, a document adopted at the national conference level? Yes, that's correct. Yes, all right. And oh, I asked you earlier about um, affiliation and disaffiliation yes. of churches. I want to turn now to the issue about credential of ministers, and obviously this code of conduct is imposed upon credentialed ministers. That's correct, isn't it? <coughs> they have to comply with it. That's correct. And if they don't comply with it, it may provide grounds for withdrawal or some other form of disciplinary action against the minister. Is that right? That is correct. What's to stop the National Conference adopting a new ministerial code which includes the adoption at that senior pastor's church of child protection policies which have been recommended by the ACC. Right. Um, nothing. Um, I would take it a step further, if I may. <laughs> Please go ahead. OK. Uh, the movement fundamentally has two types of members, individuals and organisations. We have a code of conduct for individuals. We don't have a code of conduct for organisations. So rather than perhaps put that into a code of conduct for individuals, because my concern with that would simply be individuals come and go, but the organisation is constant, maybe we could develop a code of conduct for organisations that gets accepted, and this could be indeed part of that. That would be my line of that. That is my line of thinking. All right. And that would that be possible within the current constitution and bylaws of the ACC? I would have to seek obviously um, legal counsel on that, but I sh you know, uh, if we can adopt the code of conduct for individuals, um, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know. There may be some issue on the basis that they've already come in under a certain regime and whether that regime can be changed. I would have to seek legal counsel, you know, yeah. But certainly that is, you know, an ongoing discussion and clearly as, as I have articulated thoughts that I have pondered. Yes. Um, all right, just uh, two further matters I wanted to take you to. First of all, um, I, you heard evidence yesterday about the child abuse policy that was adopted under Pastor Peterson's Indeed. term as, as senior pastor at Sunshine Coast Church. Indeed. And um, have you reviewed the, that particular document, Exhibit 18-28? Certainly. Yes. And... Um, I want to suggest to you that the standard of child protection exhibited in that document is far less than the standard which is recommended by the State Executive of Queensland. Manifestly so. Thank you. And particularly the, the focus, for example, upon the avoidance of the appearance of evil. Certainly. And um, the omission of any mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse to state child protection authorities. Clearly. And the absence of um, a recommendation that such matters, child sexual abuse matters, be reported to police. Yes, indeed. And
And um, you heard yesterday that um, that document had not been changed by the time that Pastor Peterson left um, left his position at the Sunshine Coast Church. Yes, I did hear that. And that that uh, uh, would. Would you agree that that was a serious failing by the Sunshine Coast Church to adopt a policy um, which protected children to the same standard as that recommended by the state executive? Clearly. And do you take any responsibility as the state president for a system by which your child protection, that is the state executive's child protection policy, is recommended to individual churches. But in this case, the Sunshine Coast Church failed to implement a policy of that standard. Um, I believe that we took every uh, available opportunity that was afforded us to, uh, to communicate a more robust and um, substantial policy. Uh, I can't take responsibility for the actions of a local church because I have no authority. Thank you. Uh, now, the last matter I wanted to talk to you about was the response of the, of the state executive to um, what occurred at Sunshine Coast Church. Um, and You'd agree, wouldn't you, that certainly the, that the events involving ALA, the child sexual abuse of him, was a terrible thing for both Clearly. him and his family? Shocking. But also deeply damaging to the church, Indeed, the sir. Sunshine Coast Church? Indeed, sir. And to the senior pastor who was there? Yes. And that that church was an ACC church? Yes. And that, as a result, there was also some damage done to the reputation and standing of the ACC within the community. Yes. Yes. Um, and I appreciate after yesterday's evidence there is a considerable period of time during which you were completely unaware of that conviction. That's correct. And uh, Pastor Svensson's assisted us with yes. uh, why that was the case. But having that knowledge now, yeah. namely that uh, convictions were made, um, did you consider some call, some sort of review of what happened at that church to determine let's get my phrasing right um, how and in what circumstances a child could have been abused at that church between two thousand and four and two thousand and six? Um. As a result of uh, the circumstance that has happened here and the ensuing report from Pastor Swenson, um, we have, in consultation with the National, uh, and again, you can ref check this later, but um, there is a complete review of not just the policies, but how the policies are formed. And uh, the conclusion has been made that we will have in future, our policies will be um, formed by a, a third party uh, that we engage. When you say our policies, can you yes. be a bit more specific? Yes, she... certainly the child protection policies of the ACC Australia. Yes. Yes, will be, uh, will be uh, put together by an, an organisation or by a group of people who are professional in that area. And we will pay them to service us with what is uh, the the the, uh, uh, the greatest area of uh, of child protection that we can indeed Im embark upon. Uh, now, this is an ongoing process. It happened as a result of this particular circumstance. Uh, my understanding is there are three different organisations tending for that to be the appointed organisation that that then brings us. Uh, the recommendations for what our uh, child abuse policy should be yes. and then um, takes an active <coughs> role in, in the implementation and the training of our pastors and, and churches uh, in the implementation of that document. 
Uh, is that a resolution that's been reached at the national level? Yes. Um, are you able to supply us with a copy of that resolution? Um, not not now, but right. we can ask. Uh, well, my, my, other, my understanding is, and I appreciate I, I'm not the national president, but my understanding is our next meeting, which is just a matter of weeks away, that those three organisations uh, with their with their tender will be asking, will be presenting their their. Uh, uh, their, their options. All right. Thank you for that. I, I wanted to focus, though, on what happened at the Sunshine Coast Church, and perhaps I needed to explain myself a bit more. Um, are, you, are you aware of a common term in New South Wales hospitals, for example, of a root cause analysis which occurs after a death, an unexplained death, occurs in a hospital? Right. Are you aware of that term? No, I'm not aware of that term. Yes. No. Um, are you aware of um, a number of police forces around Australia which engage in critical incident reviews following some apparent operational breach or um, <coughs> systemic apparent systemic failure? Sure. I would say I'm not directly um, a, a, a associated with that information, but it does stand a reason, and uh, I could well imagine that would be the case. Yes. Um, and why I'm asking you about that is certainly, and I'm thankful for you explaining to the Royal Commission the fact that um, there is action at the national level to review policies at that level. But what I want to know about is why you know, there does not appear to have been a, a full or comprehensive review of what happened at the bottom level, what happened at Sunshine Coast Church. The, the, the difficulty with that is that we have no access into that church. We, we, we can't go and, and, and investigate legally. Uh, we have no jurisdiction. Well, in terms of forcing the church to do so, but... No, um, no, no, no. I mean, it, actually in terms of engaging and, and asking and, and inquiring and trying to figure out what led to this... Um, uh, there's nothing. There's nothing standing in your way, for example, of writing to the the current head pastor, um, and and asking for his or her cooperation in a review to determine what happened in that period of time, inviting people such as ALA and his family to come forward and indicate. Um, what their experience of the process in during when the, the child sexual abuse was actually happening to indicate what that was and to start an analysis of what was going wrong right. within the church at that time. Right. There's, nothing to, nothing, no, there's nothing to stop that, yes. and I, I, I take on board your point, Sue. Thank you. Um, and you, you'd agree that there's merit in doing that? Yes, I, I would I agree there's merit in doing that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, you know, I, I guess my thought has been as a result of the report submitted by Gary Swenson that we then handed to the National because um, clearly uh, we are a national movement and uh, this is a national issue, not just a state issue. And, and the response of the National Executive has been as I have outlined. But you have a, you have a, a completely valid point. And, and I thank you for making it. And uh, and Pastor Svensson's his review was really into the, the the communication or lack thereof between the ACC at the state level, the victim and yeah. the victim's family, yeah. wasn't it? I, I, yes, it was. And I, it didn't go to no, those other matters. No, it didn't. I, I hear your point. Yes. And I think you make a very good one. And I thank you for making it. Right. Yes, those are my questions for uh, Pastor Thanks. Hunt. Thanks. Thank you. No, thank you, Mr. O'Brien. No, thank you, Mr. Chowdhury. That's fine. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, did you yes. say no questions? No, I didn't. I said I just need my solicitors just giving me some instructions. Yeah. I apologise for that. Uh, are you aware, sir, that the uh, Sunshine Coast Church now, with its new pastor, has adopted the uh, ACC Queensland Child Protection Policy? That church is now part of a, a, a broader network of churches, and I would be aware, because I have a relationship with that pastor, that that would be so. All right. Thank you. Uh, 
1998, Queensland had developed a child protection policy which formed part of the Queensland Assembly of God Ministers' Manual. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. I was wondering if uh, the uh, policy uh, version 2007, which is a tab 43 of the policies tender bundle, could be brought up, please? In particular, if we could go to ringtail uh, 0471. Are you aware of the policy that provides specific uh, rules in responding to a child who discloses abuse, correct? Yes, I am. And uh, it's set out, uh, as we go <coughs> down the page, uh, significant guidance to how a person should respond, correct? That's correct. As we just see on the page there, there's a flowchart. Yes, that's correct. I want to take you to page 0472. If you just scroll down the page, there's a specific policy in respect of the victim is over the age of 18, but it's reporting abuse occurring when they're a child. Yes. Now, this seems to be uh, something we haven't seen from other states. This is something that was specifically put in the Queensland policy. Right. And the uh, policy specifically states that encouragement should be made for the uh, victim to uh, report their abuse to the police. Yes, that's correct. All right. Thank you. Yes, I've nothing further. Uh, yes, just one matter arising. Um, you said a, a moment ago in, an, in answer to a question from Mr Chowdhury that um, the Sunshine Coast Church had adopted, I think it's the document entitled ACC Queensland Policies and Key Procedural Elements Document <coughs> 2013. Yeah. And they've adopted the whole of that, have they, as their local policy? Yeah, well, you see, that church has now become um, part of a, of a broader church which has numerous locations and a more robust administrative capacity. I see. And, uh, and, and the leader of that church is also now the regional, uh, the, the regional director. And when you say, or what's the information upon which you say that they've adopted this uh, particular policy? It's, it's merely, oh, good, good. Uh, thank you for bringing that out. That's merely my relationship with the individual. I, I have spoken to the pastor of that church since the um, advent of this and I've asked him where are things at and, and we've had several conversations. I see. Uh, and are you aware of... What, uh, what training or implementation of this particular policy has been undertaken at the, the Sunshine Coast Not campus in detail. of that church? Not in detail, no. Yes, nothing further. Just a couple of matters, um, Pastor Hunt. <clears throat> Can I just take you back to the issue that um, we spoke about earlier with respect to uh, a person calling themselves a pastor without having the formal credentials? Yes. Uh, issued by the national body, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. That issues the credentials. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And I understood you to um, say to us that there was um, nothing in the current constitutional rules or protocols or guidelines that prohibits uh, a, a member of a local autonomous church from using that title, a local affiliated church from That's using that title. Is that correct? To the best of my knowledge, that is correct, Your Honour. So does that, in, in particular, someone calling themselves a youth pastor when, in fact, they don't hold the credentials endorsed by the national body, does that strike you as a dangerous... Yes, it... as, a, as a dangerous um, omission... Yes, it does, Your Honour. And, and why? Because um, the term carries with it an implied level of trust. It's been placed there by a, an, an organisation that indeed adopts that. And so, uh, you, you know, um, 
it's a little bit like I imagine you, you can call yourself a counsellor, but do you have the qualifications? Do you have the endorsement? You know, what what stops you from putting up a, sh a shackle saying oh, I'm a counsellor, come and talk with me? Mm. You know, there is an implied level of trust, so that there should be a, a greater level of accountability to mitigate that that implied level of trust. So is that something that you'll take back to the organisation? To be honest, it is. It's actually never occurred to me until you just brought that up a moment ago. But there is, there is nothing that would prohibit that, and it, it, it's a very valid point, and I thank you for raising that with me. And can I take you just to one other matter? Um, you, again, I've understood the uh, import of the evidence that you've given with respect to the requirement for compliance with child protection policies for... Um, individual affiliated churches, oh, sorry, that there is no requirement at the moment to comply with the policies of the there is no national body. There is no man mandatory requirement, that's correct. But there's a debate that's uh, underway. Is the effect of your evidence... Yes, well... Is that correct, that there's um, a debate underway? There's certainly a debate underway uh, at the state level. Uh, I have debated this with members of my state executive and people of, uh, of influence and authority around me at that level, yes. And are you able to assist us with understanding um, in, in general terms what the resistance might be to doing that? Um, in general terms, the resistance... It, Historically, in the, in, in, the, in the context of our movement, the sacred cow, for want of a better term, is the autonomy of the local church. And anything that interferes with the autonomy of the local church is considered to be off, you know, off, uh, off, uh, out, out of bounds. And, and so does this interfere with the autonomy of the local church would be in, in, indeed at the point of contention at, at a broader level. In other words, uh, we are not a denomination. We don't want to be told what to do by a central body. Right. Anything arising out of that for...? No, nothing arising. Not from me, thank you. Yes, thank you, Pastor Hunt. Thank you for your attendance and you otherwise excuse me. I call Wayne Alcorn. Your Honour, while he's coming to the stand, might I just mention my reappearance, uh, Philip Gerber, GRBR for Hillsong and Brian Houston. Thanks, 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 Mr. Gerber. Uh, Pastor, do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? I prefer the affirmation, thank you. All right. If you could uh, repeat after me, please. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but and the nothing truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat, please. Sir, can you please state your full name for the royal commission? Wayne Alexander Alcorn. And you've provided your address to the Royal Commission? I have. And your occupation is a Minister of Religion? It is. And you've provided two statements to the Royal Commission, that's correct? That's correct. And uh, the first is dated the 19th of September 2014? Yes. And uh, are there any amendments you wish to make to that statement? No, if that's about the broad... That's the one concerning the broader ACC. Because there was a second one concerning the Baldwin case. Yes, that's correct. Now, the one regarding the ACC is correct. Um, I tender that statement. 18.0038. Um, and your second statement is dated uh, the 28th of September 2014. That's the one with uh, nine annexures. Yes. And are there any changes to that statement we, you wish to make? I have advised the Commission that in paragraph 3 there is an amendment that I need to make if and it's not already been amended. And what is that? I'll have that brought up on the screen. That Jonathan Baldwin, second line of uh, the third, third point.
point. Jonathan Baldwin was a youth pastor at the redacted church in Budroom when he was charged. He was in fact merely attending. He was not on staff at that <coughs> church. He offended at the Sunshine Coast Church but was merely attending the other church. All right, and who, have, who informed you of that? I've spoken to both the, the man who was the senior pastor at the time and also confirmed that with the man who was the associate pastor at that time. Thank you. Uh, so with that amendment, is uh, the statement of the 28th of September 2014 true and correct? Yes, it is. I tend to that statement. 18.0039. Um, Pastor, you were in, in, in the hearing room when... Um, Pastor Hunt gave his evidence just a little while ago. Yes. And um, you'll recall I took him to uh, the child protection policy of the Sunshine Coast. Yes. And uh, asked him about um, the way in which the state policy of, with respect to child protection in Queensland operated. Yes. And... Um, he agreed with me on a, on a, on a number of points, but um, the one I wanted to ask you about was that have you also had opportunity to have a look at um, Exhibit 18-28, namely the child abuse policy of the Sunshine Coast from 2006? Yes. And do you agree with what Pastor Hunt said, that it was of a substantially lower standard than the one that was recommended at the state level? I totally agree. Yes. Um, and do you also agree with um, uh, sorry, I withdraw that. Um, I went through the process by which it's adopted at, at the state level and then it's communicated through to local churches through a process of seminars, training, yes. um, state conferences and so forth, yes. newsletters, communication through the website and so on. And I think you'd agree that notwithstanding all of that process, the child protection policies at the Sunshine Coast Church never reached that standard um, in the period 2004, I think. We start there all the way through to the end of Pastor Peterson's time as senior pastor in 2012. They were way short of the standards that we would ask for. Yes. Um, and do you also agree with the... I think he um, termed it as a block, really, a, in terms of any further implementation in the sense that there, um, there was an inability of the state executive <coughs> to require the church to adopt um, a child protection policy of the same standard that the state executive was recommending. I hear that, but over the last two or three years, there have been serious discussions. Uh, Enhanced, no doubt, by the communication from Gary Swinson through to the National Executive, which has been tabled here at the Commission. Uh, further conversations <coughs> have been had regarding whether or not a church's registration should be linked, firstly, to a senior pastor uh, being prepared to adopt the required child abuse policies. And secondly, there is even conversations regarding whether around a church's registration can be linked to the demand of the church, not just the senior pastor adhering to a policy, but the church. Yes. That's, that's, as has already been said, that really does challenge the very fabric of who we are, of a, of a, a movement of autonomous churches. But we're prepared to have that discussion yeah. and, and pursue it. Well... There is, a, there is a tension, really, between having a national movement which accredits churches and, pa and pastors yes. and the autonomy of local churches, isn't there? There is, and our only link at this point, really, is the credentialing of a pastor, and the only way they can be an affiliated ACC church is to have a credential pastor. So that does give us some leverage, but we would, we would discuss further... Uh, whether or not that's enough. All right. Now, uh, we discussed with, with Pastor Hunt the, some of the mechanisms by which that might occur. So, for example, amendments made to the Ministerial Code of Conduct to ensure that a senior pastor, first of all, um, put
put into place child protection policies of the standard which had been recommended at the state level. That's already well and truly in discussion. All right. And when you say it's in discussion... At national executive level. All right. It, has it been put on the agenda? I believe it has. Uh, we have... We've tabled a number of national executive minutes. Uh, it's certainly, if it's not officially there, it's definitely in conversation and in committee. All right. And um, is there a particular recommendation that you're taking forward to national conference? We have or a national maybe... conference next year in April, and yes, there will be. That the failure to adequately protect children in this area will be a breach of the Code of Conduct. Um, and... So the failure to adequately protect children, so did that include, for example, whether a, a pastor um, takes appropriate steps to, well, let's go through them, report suspicions to child protection authorities, sometimes called mandatory reporting? Yes. Um, that uh, the senior pastor takes steps to report suspicions of child sexual abuse to police? Yes. Um, that the senior pastor implements child protection policies of the standard um, recommended by the state executive of the and ACC. national executive, yes. yes. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that covers credentials. And then what the process of accreditation or affiliation of, of particular churches... What's the mechanism that you, that you would use or that is under discussion at the moment for ensuring that individual churches adopt child protection policies of an appropriate standard? There's one that we... which I, I don't think is going to be a major challenge, and that is the registration at that first level, at the entry level, should we use that term, of a church into the ACC. There are a number of things that are required for a church to become registered with the Assemblies of God. Uh, now ACC. The, uh, I don't see it as a major challenge for us to include we, uh, the adoption and the adherence to a child protection policy. They, they have to have certain other things such as a, a suitable and an appropriate constitution in place. It's not a hard thing at that level. The, a recommendation will be going back to the National Executive out of this commission and process to, to seriously examine whether or not we can demand for ongoing registration, the adoption and the adherence to a policy for child protection. Well, it had, certainly some of the, some of the churches uh, that are affiliated within the ACC movement are large and um, long-standing. Are they not? I passed one. Yes, and uh, obviously we've heard from um, Pastor Brian Houston, Hillsong is another one of those. Yes. Um, have you approached them yourself to suggest that um, that might be a, a viable way, that is to say that the continuing affiliation of individual churches may be made dependent upon the adoption of child protection policies of an appropriate standard? We have members of the Hillsong Church serving at, at every level whether it be a region, a state and national level. And they are in those conversations and there's no resistance from Hillsong to be part of that. All right. What about your church? More than happy. We need to set the example. All right. Now, the adoption of policy is one thing I'm sure you appreciate and the implementation yes. and compliance with that policy yes. is another thing. Um, what are the, what are the, what's, what is the current consideration about those parts of the process. Obviously, you have to establish the standard, but what's the follow-on from that? If the, Once the standard is pegged at an appropriate level, <coughs> what's the approach that's being considered for compli examining compliance with that policy and procedure, and what do you do where compliance is not adhered to. Are we talking about the, 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 the local church now? Or the yes, local? we're talking about... Yes, I'm, I want you to focus on the local church. Yes. So the policy is pegged at a particular level. It's made a requirement, or at least this fact is being under discussion, yes. of affiliation and of credentialing of the senior pastor. 
what's the next stage, presuming that that occurs, for ensuring compliance with um, that standard? Firstly, we've got to get there. Yes, it's, it's down the road. It I is down the road. The, we have a history of, of training, and there's been evidence given by different state presidents, uh, of which I was one for a number of years, uh, where we offer training, and it's comprehensive at many levels, including governance, workplace health and safety, and in this area of child protection. And there is a culture of cooperation. And we then have, in those processes, had people go in, obviously in an autonomous, self-governing church, on invitation by the church. We've actually had audits done, checklists. We may have even tendered that for the commission. We certainly could. Uh, where, where those things are, are assessed and processed. And uh, that would be a part of, of that new regime. All right, I'll, I'll have uh, Mr Camparioli <coughs> follow that up with your instructing, sure. your solicitor. All right, now, um, you say there's a high degree of cooperation with those sorts of matters and, um, and a reasonable level of training throughout a number of churches within the ACC movement. It's offered to all churches. Yes. All right. Uh, but you'd certainly recognise in terms of Sunshine Coast, there does not appear to have been uh, an acceptance of those matters, the training and so forth, um, for the implementation of child protection policies in that church. They didn't take the opportunities yes. that were offered to them. Yes. So you'd agree that providing those opportunities has been insufficient to be able to ensure that Sunshine Coast Church, for example, adopted policies of a standard recommended by the State Executive? Yes, it was. Um, I also took uh, Pastor Hunt to the issue about whether um, some form of review should have been conducted or could have been conducted into um, the offending by Mr Baldwin at the Sunshine Coast Church. Do you agree with him that there is merit in undertaking um, such a review of an individual church where criminal offences have been proven um, to have occurred at the church by a credentialed minister of the ACC? We want to do all we can to ensure our churches are safe places for children, young people, young families. So we're not resistant to that. We'd be very open to it. We're, we're, a, we're a movement that attracts many, many young people and young families, and we, we are most happy to cooperate and, uh, and pursue that. It's, it, I agree with, with Pastor Hunt. It's a, it's a worthy consideration. All right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I want to move on to another issue, and this is the, um, the, the matter of conflict of interest. And uh, were, you, did you, were you listening to some of the evidence that was given in the first I've part? I've been that... here almost every day. Yes, all right, thank you. And um, you recall that I asked Pastor Brian Houston about, uh, about con whether he considered he had a conflict of interest. I recall that. Um, in terms of handling his own... Um, uh, the allegations against his father. Um, I should ask you first... Um, you were on the National Executive, as I understand it, in 1999. Yes, I was. And you were at the, uh, the meeting in December of 1999 when Pastor Houston brought the allegations against his father to the meeting. Yes, I was. Yes. Um, and you've heard the evidence which... Um, you've heard the evidence about his involvement with his father prior to that meeting... And then after that meeting? Yes, I did. Yes. Is there any doubt in your mind that he had a conflict of interest in performing his role as both the national president of the ACC and being his father's son? I was the man that told Pastor John McMartin to phone him. There was no doubt in my mind that, given my many years of experience with Brian Houston, that at first he was a man of integrity... Second, that we had a team of men in leadership that were going to address this properly and that there was a proven track record of us not trying to hide things nor compromise the process. So I, 
I know how some people perceive this, but there is no doubt in my mind that there was nothing untoward happening, nor was there, was there an intentional conflict of interest. I'm asking you a different question, and it's not an intentional conflict of interest. It's not a question about whether the process produced the right or the wrong outcome. Clearly, the man was suspended at that yes, stage. Correct. But would you not accept that those two duties of a son and of the National President of the Assemblies of God, on receipt of allegations against his father, that that produced, on the face of it, a conflict of interest between those two roles? I would agree that on the face of it, that's how it appears. I would also need to say, as somebody that was in the room when the matter was dealt with, that from the moment Brian Houston brought that to the National Executive, he was disengaged, though it's been brought to this Commission that he was in the room. There's no doubt that he was in the room. But he was uh, particularly emotional, as anybody would be, and in no way did he guide the discussion or the outcome. But I understand, and if we were to do it again, we would not do it that way. All right. And in fact, I think the next national executive meeting that happened a year later, he in fact stepped out of the room after raising the issue of the further allegations from New Zealand. I believe he did. All right. And do you think it would have been preferable to, for him to have done that? Or I for think, the, I for think the chair today... To have, sorry, just let me ask the question, or for the chair to have asked him to leave the room while the decision was made. Sure. Um, now, you'd agree that uh, one of the decisions that was made at the National Executive meeting in December of 1999 was that um, Pastor Frank Houston would be admitted to a process of rehabilitation or restoration to ministry. You understand that? Yes. And you also knew, didn't you, at that time that the National Conference had adopted a policy whereby any person found to have engaged in pedophilia was not to be restored to ministry. Do you, do you understand that? I do. Yes. And that was the extent of your knowledge at that time? Yes. And it appears that the... Sorry, I withdraw that. The minutes of the meeting record that a decision was made to restore Frank Houston to ministry after a period of, and a process of supervision and so forth, contrary to the resolution of national conference that those found to have engaged in pedophilia not be restored to ministry. I think I understand your question. Yeah, sorry, it was a bit long-winded. It was a long one, but I understand where you were going. Yes. The... As somebody in that room that day, there was no expectation in my heart or in my mind that Frank Houston would return to ministry. It was clearly stated by Keith Ainger earlier in this commission hearing that the, the, the intent of restoration for Frank Houston was back into a relationship with God and family. Though I did see the minutes, and I don't agree with that as, as our desire for Frank Houston, there was, in that moment, real... There, there was... It was unclear. We, we, we did not know the identity of the person. We, we understood this person didn't want to go to police. We do know that it was with a young person. So, uh, if, if your question is, should Frank Houston have been removed from ministry forever once we knew that there was a sexual offence with a minor? Should he have been removed from ministry? Yes, he should have. Yes. And you'd agree that the, the minutes appear to record that in what, in fact, the National Executive did was set up a process by which he could be, if he applied and if he was approved by the State <coughs> Executive, he could be approved to He would never have, ministry. but those minutes record that he could be. Yes, and you agree that that was a departure from the, um, the, the rule adopted at national conference that pedophiles not return to yes. ministry. Yes. All right. Um, now, you've heard the evidence, uh, as I understand it, with respect to Pastor Layman. Yes. 
and um, certainly we have Mr Svensson's report, which refers to a conflict of interest. You're aware of that? With the, with the family relationship? Are we talking? Well, in terms of whether the matter, that is, the allegations against um, Jonathan Baldwin were reported to, um, to the state executive. Yes. Yes. And um, I think I'm correct in saying that Mr Svensson's report was critical of Pastor Lehman for not providing that material, particularly once Mr Baldwin had been charged, to the state exec executive. Um, and it may also extend to the conviction in 2009. Do you understand that? The state executive was acting in a, in a real area of, of silence. There was very, very little, if any, information flowing from that local church or pastor back to the state executive. Yes, and I think I'm correct in saying that uh, Mr Svensson was critical of Pastor Lehman because he said he had a conflict of interest and that was one of the reasons why such information about child sexual abuse had not made its way to the state executive. Do you understand yes, that? I do. Yes. Now, you've also heard evidence, no doubt, about... Um, I'll put it to you accurately, that in the report, which is uh, Tender Bundle 22 in the um, Sunshine Coast documents, it'll just come up. And if we go through to Ringtail 95, you'll see there under A, B and C, that uh, the senior pastor was the father-in-law of the offender and that he failed to inform anyone or take any action when serious concerns were expressed to him by a church member during the period when the offences were taking place. Do you see that? I do. And that he was not relating closely to the ACC. In fact, he left the ACC in June of 2006, I understand. I understand, so yes. All right. Uh, but in any event, there is concern there about a, a, fam a familial conflict of interest, isn't there? Yes. Yes. And that's been recognised at the state and I think the, the national level when it received this report. Yes. All right. Um, do I take it, given that um, this issue about familial conflict of interest has arisen in um, both the Hillsong part of this case study and uh, the Sunshine Coast part, that um, it's not unusual for um, family members to be involved in the life of a church in terms of those related to the senior minister? No, it's common. Yes. And um, we know from the Ministerial Code of Conduct that conflict of interest is addressed in that document. Yes. You'd agree with that? Yes. But that the focus, I can take it to you, I, I can take you to it, um, if you like, but do you agree that the focus of that conflict of interest is around financial matters? Primarily, and I, I know what the point you're trying to make, and I agree that that should be certainly reviewed. Yes, but primarily at the moment it is around financial issues. Yes, and do you see that there is merit in reviewing that um, code of conduct to address this issue of familial conflict of interest? Yes. Yes. Right. Um, so that deals with the matter at the, um, at the credentialed minister level. Oh, I'll, in fact, I'll leave it there. Um, Your Honour, I noticed... Uh, it's just before 11. Is that a suitable time? Suitable time to take the mid-morning break. Thank you.
Pastor, I'll ask you um, about uh, some evidence that arose this morning from uh, Pastor Hunt, and that's about the uh, credentialing of pastors. Um, and you recall that Pastor Hunt said that the first record there appears to be of um, it, Jonathan Baldwin having any form of credential was on the 14th of July 2005. He was given, I think, a provisional ministerial certificate. Is that what they're called, a PMC? Yeah, probationary, yes. Probation. PMC, same thing, yes. Thank you. Um, now, we know from Pastor Lehman that um, Baldwin, Mr Baldwin was involved in youth ministry in South Australia, but we're not aware of um, whether he had any credential prior to coming to the Sunshine Coast. Are you able to assist us with that at all? My understanding is that he was a volunteer um, and active in a local church in South Australia, but never credentialed. All right. Um, and Pastor Lehman indicated in his statement, and I think also in his evidence, that he was recruited into the position of something called the youth pastor. Do you, you understand that, first yes. of all? Yes, I do. Um, and it appears that um, um, during the time that he was at the Sunshine Coast Church that he called himself the youth pastor yep. and that the senior pastor there at the church also um, referred to him as the youth pastor. Yes. And he had responsibility as the youth pastor for a group of, I think, sometimes up to 80 children who were in either the children... Like children's ministry or the youth ministry? Yes. Is that your understanding? Yes, it is. Yes. Right. Now, you will have also heard that... Um, um, well, I'll ask you, is it possible within the ACC movement for a person to call themselves, to star themselves as youth pastor when they do not have a credential? Yes, because it's, it is a function rather than just a mere title. The word pastor simply means the shepherd people. And so they are doing that. And some are, st are on staff, some are in a voluntary capacity. Many of our churches, as has been highlighted in this commission, are churches that are under 200 people. And so people would function in that role without necessarily having a credential, and they're volunteers. So there are a number of churches that would use that title. I, I heard it raised this morning, and it's an interesting discussion. We've never had that, but I'm open to it. Um, you're aware that um, certainly from a from a lawyer's point of view, the, you you understand that um, first of all, um, we're all required to have practicing certificates. Yes, I'm aware of that. And uh, police officers are required to have appropriate yes. credentials for that. Yes. And that for police officers, it's an offence to hold yourself out there to the world. Um, to be a police officer when you're not. You understand yes. that? Yes. And there are also similar offences, I think, for holding yourself out as a solicitor or barrister when you are not um, credentialed, if you like, to do that. You understand that? I would hope so, yes. All right. Now, the danger, I think, that was <coughs> raised with Pastor Hunt this morning was that the... Um, was that the... There are people who are called pastor or senior pastor who do have credentials from your organisation. That's yes, correct, isn't it? Correct. But um, just judging from the title pastor, it does not necessarily follow that a person has a credential, even though they may be calling themselves pastor. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And um, it's important for the standing of the ACC for people to understand that... It has a, um, a rigorous process for the credentialing of ministers. Yes. And would you agree that it, that process and its standing is somewhat undermined if other people could walk around saying, I am a pastor? Oh. I, I, could, I, could, I understand your point, yes. yes. Um, and in fact... That extends, oh, sorry, I'll draw that. Obviously, if you're a credentialed minister, you're required to comply with the Code of Conduct. Yes. And that there are processes for the removal of your credential if you don't comply with that Code of Conduct. There are. 
and if your credential is withdrawn, that may threaten the ability of the church itself, if you're a senior pastor there, to call itself um, a member of the ACC. Unless replaced by another uh, credential pastor, yes. But indeed, it's a very serious thing. It is. And um, it's the effect of the, the main coercive measure by which you require pastors to comply with your code of conduct. Yes. And uh, clearly, if somebody is calling themselves a pastor and operating within um, an ACC church, you do not have the same coercive powers over that person because, simply stated, they do not have a credential. I agree. And as, as I said earlier, it's both a function and an office. Uh, many people pass to people. And uh, some might bestow that title upon them. But I see from an official perspective, I, I understand the questioning and I understand the demands that we should place upon them, yes. All right. Um, so does that mean, that having given that answer, Pastor Alcorn, that that's something that you'll take back to the National Executive? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, it, it will be a very interesting conversation. But yes, I, I certainly will. And you, you appreciate um, from the questions that Mr Beckett's asked you that uh, with respect to a youth pastor, that carries with it very particular dangers. Yes, it does. I understand that. Um, and those dangers were um, articulated by Pastor Hunt that, of course, um, mean that those members of the congregation uh, who bring their children and young people to the church uh, are entitled to conclude that if the person who they entrust their children to carries the title youth pastor, that that person is someone who is credentialed by the church. They have every right to assume that when they send their children to a youth program or any activity in the life of our church, that those, those children and young people will be cared for by properly trained, recognised leaders. Absolutely. Thanks, Mr B. Um, and just to, to wrap up that issue, particularly about the code of conduct, uh, you heard from Pastor, we heard from Pastor Hunt earlier today that... Um, there are certain matters in the code of conduct where, which are stated as, as um, important. I think they, if you breach them, they're prohibited. I think that's the word that's yes. used in the code of conduct. Yes. One of those is, of course, child sexual abuse. Yes. And um, there are certain doctrinal matters which also fall into that category. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Perhaps I could just ask you simply, what could be more important than the child, than the protection of children for the credentialing of ministers? Nothing. Nothing. In fact, in, in our credentialing process now, every state which processes the credential before it arrives at the national executive demands in each state. I live in Queensland. You have to have a blue card. There are police checks. It is, it is part of the entire process. In fact, you don't go further beyond the application if you cannot provide that, uh, that clearance from the, the relative uh, state police departments or child uh, protection offices. I see. But um, that, those requirements, I think, as we've established, have, do not extend to the adoption of child protection policies of a particular standard in the church in which that pastor ministers? No, but I've already committed to pursuing that. Uh, we have a conference next year. Uh, there is a process to get to the conference. The National Executive meets within coming weeks. It, it is an agenda item that it will be addressed. Yes. All right. Now, just a, a couple of other matters that have, that have <coughs> arisen through the process um, of... Um, of evidence heard at this public hearing. Um, you recall that uh, there's an obligation in the ministerial code for somebody who, a pastor who is engaged in child sexual abuse, for example, to report that fact to the state president? Yes. Yes. Um, and you would understand, no doubt, that if somebody wanted to 
continue to operate, to operate as a minister, to minister in a particular church in breach of that obligation, um, that on occasion that, that that might occur? I can't see how that would occur. Yeah, sorry, I've, I've put that wrong. I'll, I'll ask it a, a different way. Um, some, and perhaps a rogue minister, might want to try and continue to um, continue as the senior pastor in a church, notwithstanding that certain allegations of child sexual abuse had arisen or been referred to the police? I think I understand your question. Yes. Um, I think I'm not putting it perhaps in the right way. I'll ask you another question. Um, there are, there may be occasions where the the minister who is affected does not provide that report to the uh, to the state president. You'd accept that as a possibility. Are we speaking of the person who's who's alleged to have committed the yes, crime, or yes. the person themselves? Yeah, the person who's committed the. Once crime. we become aware, they're suspended immediately. Yes, no, I understand that. It's the notification process that I wanted to ask you about. Right. You understand that such people might be motivated not to tell the state president that there were such allegations. I understand that all pedophiles have motivations to never be caught. Yes. Right. Now there's um, there's no requirement in the code of conduct for another pastor who becomes aware of uh, such allegations, right. charges of child sexual abuse, to report that matter to the state president? I don't believe there is, but I, I do believe it's worthwhile. Yes. And there's merit in considering placing such an obligation upon, on, upon credentialed ministers so that if they become aware of those matters, they are required to report them to the it's state. very good merit in that, yes. Yes. Right. And I think that arose in, in, in this particular case. So, for example, <coughs> the, where ALA went to a church where he, um, which was not the Sunshine Coast Church, but an, another church in that area, he revealed that he had been sexually abused by um, Baldwin to that pastor. Um, and while he took action to go to the parents and then the matter was taken promptly to the police, <coughs> he wasn't the person who provided that information to the state executive in Queensland. No, he wasn't. I, I, I know the man concerned, and he's a good man, and he's not part of our movement. He's part of another movement. Oh, I see, yes. And uh, if, I, if I understood the evidence given by ALA's father... Um, he didn't. Uh, I don't believe it was he who advised us. But as I say, he's not an ACC pastor. All right. Um, and a couple of more matters. Um, you recall during the Hillsong part of the uh, of this public hearing that there was some evidence given <coughs> about the initial written complaint, which is required <coughs> to commence the process under the grievance procedure. Yes, yes I did. And that is uh, just to be clear for those who are listening that um, the process of considering whether to suspend a credential and um, and whether ultimately to remove the credential of a pastor of the ACC commences with <coughs> a process of written complaint to I think it's the state executive is that correct? Written complaint can be to anybody. It will be then handed back to the state executive to investigate. Unless but it can, it can go to a region, state or, or national. All right. Um, and were you also here when Mr Agajanian gave evidence about the process within Hillsong? Yes, I was. And do you recall that in terms of Hillsong's internal processes um, for child protection matters, that he said, doesn't matter how the information comes to us, it's recorded by the person receiving the information. Yes, I heard that. And that the process then commences as a result of that. Yes. So there seems to be a difference between um, the ACC national process, which requires a written complaint from the complainant, and the process internally within Hillsong, which seems much more flexible and 
just allows for an oral complaint to be made, which is then recorded in writing and passed up the line. Do you, do you, understand, do you see the difference between those two? I see the difference, and you did say that it was eventually recorded in writing. For us, just in the terms of natural justice and for due process, it has to eventually be put in writing somewhere. We're not resistant to, to receiving a complaint. Uh, our pastors live a very public life and people can make all sorts of accusations, sometimes malicious, sometimes with all sorts of agendas. And so there does need to be some protection whereby eventually somebody is prepared to make a complaint in writing and we're more than happy to provide any assistance if there's a language barrier if there's other issues we're happy all we need is eventually so that we've got an official record that it goes in writing but we're not resistant to initially <coughs> receiving something verbally do you understand that uh, oh sorry first of all the but the administration manual requires it to be in writing yes and for that to have come from the complainant yes yes so do you think there is merit in reviewing that particular requirement in the grievance procedure, there is merit. Absolutely. so that it starts with a written complaint, but it may be something recorded by an ACC member having received that information orally from the complainant. We're taking many things out of this commission. That'll be one of them. And then I think the final, you recall um, in the, the north side part of um, the public hearing, there were some issues about contribution to compensation um, after civil proceedings had been filed in that matter. Do you recall that issue? I can... Yes, I recall that yes. issue. And there were concerns within... Northside Christian Centre that they had insufficient funds or assets yes. to apply to meeting the compensation claim of the children in that matter. Yes. Um, they were insured, of course, but the evidence was that the insurance didn't cover the entirety <coughs> of the liability that the church faced. Sure. Um, is that the contribution... Sorry, I'll withdraw that... Um, you recognise that depending on the individual church and the insurance arrangements that they entered into, it may be that sometimes the church will fall short in being able to meet a compensation claim from somebody who had been sexually abused as a child. Do you understand that? Yes. Um, is there any merit in the ACC at the national level giving consideration to some form of process whereby it can contribute to any shortfall that is experienced by an individual church? Despite the fact that we've got many, many churches you've heard today, we there is only a, quite a small contribution made by those churches. We have limited resources to be able to do such a thing. We do have an insurance brokerage arm, that we're not the underwriter with a broker, and Many of these conversations should be handled by them, not by the movement and the pastors. We, we genuinely have limited resources to be able to do too much in those things, but we would, we would encourage and invite our, our insurance brokerage arm to get involved only when we can and where we can. We simply, in the Northside case, I was on the executive when that came up. We just did not have the capacity to do anything. Yes. That's the, the conclusion of my questions. Just before um, I hand over to other counsel who may wish to ask uh, Pastor Alcorn some questions, uh, a matter has arisen that I just need to determine prior to him concluding his evidence. So if I could have just a, a short five-minute yes. adjournment to do that. Yes, of course.
Um, just before we move to um, the remainder of Pastor Alcorn's evidence, um, uh, Mr O'Brien, on behalf of the family that is ALA and his family, has a short statement to read out from them. Um, and um, the parties have been given a copy of the written versions of that statement already. But um, if I could ask, invite Mr O'Brien to read those onto the record, please. Yes. Thanks, Mr O'Brien. Thank you. Uh, this is a statement from ALC. Uh, we would like to thank the Royal Commission for allowing us to have our voices heard. As ALD and I have been brought up in Christian families and have been involved in teaching Sunday school and youth activities, our prayer was to bring our three sons up in the way of the Lord. Unfortunately, we have had this horrendous event in a place we believed was a safe and good environment. Even over these last few days, not one of the ACC executive have come and asked us how we or our son are going. Our son has been watching these hearings and is so angry that every level of the ACC seems to be still passing the buck and blaming someone else, not caring for the victim. I would ask, is anyone now going to contact him and ask him how he is going and sorry we have brought all this up again? I would like to ask, why should ALA have had to pay a lawyer's fee of $145,000 he did nothing wrong. This is a statement uh, by ALA. <clears throat> the past 10 years of my life have been a living hell. I want to be clear that my position is that Ian Lehman, the Sunshine, Ch Church Co the Sunshine Coast Church leaders and the Australian Christian Church's leaders completely and utterly failed to acknowledge, take responsibility support and help my family to, and I to anywhere near an acceptable level. They failed to detect the abuse. They failed to prevent the abuse. They failed to support us through the criminal trial process. They failed to support us after Baldwin was convicted. They failed to support us achieve early and fair compensation. It appears to me they were more concerned about the reputation and financial position of the ACC above all else. The way the likes of Ian Lehman, Gary Swenson and others associated with the ACC have attempted to justify their failings and minimise their responsibilities in this Royal Commission has made me even more angry about what happened to me and how it was dealt with. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. <coughs> so I have no further questions for Pastor Alcorn. Thanks, Mr. Beckett. Mr. Koenig. Nothing, Your Honour. Thank you. Nothing. Mr. Um, Mr. Nothing. Gerber. Nothing. Mr. Thank you. Chowdhury. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Pastor Alcorn, is there anything that you wish to add to the evidence you've already given in your statements and oral evidence here today? Yes, there is. Firstly, I want to thank the Commission for the ability to respond in these issues. Secondly, to the, the victims of child abuse, to their families. I've personally been in almost all of this case hearing. And it's a tragedy. It's, it should never happen in any church. And I'm saddened. And on behalf of the leadership of the ACC, I truly express deep sympathy to the victims and to the families. And we do commit to, to doing more, to creating places where children and young people are encouraged and helped in life in, in, in churches where policies and procedures are best practice. I would, I would, on behalf of the ACC, ask the Commission to consider that across our nation, each state has standardised legislation in the area of child protection and a national organisation such as ours has state executives required to provide template child protection policies which have to be continued to change because of the different legislation. 
it makes it easier for us as a national organisation where ministers move across the nation to be able to have a standard process that is in line with standard standardised legislation. So we would genuinely love to see that and would continue to work with the outcomes of this commission. And on behalf of the ACC, I, I want to say that it has been our desire to always have churches where, where children are helped and, and, and protected. I acknowledge that there have been cases. I've just heard statements read. I acknowledge that that's happened. And we are committed, enhanced by this commission, but through who we are and what we already were doing, to just continue to improve our policies and procedures so children and young people in our nation are cared for and protected. Okay, so I have nothing further. Thank you. <clears throat> nothing rising. Thank you, Pastor Alcorn. Thank you for your attendance and you're otherwise excused. There's some, just some housekeeping matters yes. to conclude the evidence in this matter. Um, in the north side part of the hearing, there's a statement from Douglas Holton, the current principal at Northside Christian College. He was not called, um, although his statement was, of course, served upon all of the parties. The statement is dated... 15th of September 2014, and I tender that statement. 18.0040. In the Sunshine Coast part of the uh, public hearing, there were some issues about the date on which, on which Mr Baldwin was charged. Um, and there's no list of the 47 charges which he received on that date. We've located that from the uh, Queensland Police Service material, and um, I tender what's called the Queensland Police Service Court Brief with respect to Jonathan Baldwin... 18.0041. It remains so I should say that concludes the evidence in case number case study eighteen. Thank you. Um, but it remains to set a timetable with respect to submissions. I'll, um, does your, does your Honour and Commissioner have a copy of the draft directions? No. I'll hand that up now. And I'll also hand up... Um, sorry, there are two copies of a draft direction not to publish. Thank you. I'll just briefly uh, read it onto the record, uh, Your Honour, that uh, Council Assisting will provide written submissions by the 14th of November, with any submissions in reply to those submissions to be filed by the 5th of December 2014. And then um, what is a, a, a relatively new practice within the Royal Commission that um, provision is made for a reply to those submissions to be filed by the 12th of December with a view to an oral hearing, if necessary, being listed for the 17th of December 2014. And as I understand from the bar table, is there are 
are no concerns about that particular timetable. I hope I'm right in saying that. Yes, that's correct from my part. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Great. And uh, communications may be made with the other parties um, who are not in attendance today about that. Um, uh, an allied direction with that, Your Honour, is um, <coughs> that written submissions be kept. I'm oh, sorry, I withdraw that. Uh, an allied direction is that any such written submissions are not to be published, save to the relevant parties, until um, the oral hearing on the 17th of December. I note that um, this particular direction not to publish has does not set a date for its expiry and um, can, uh, might invite Your Honour to include that in the, uh, in the direction. Namely, words to the effect <clears throat> that the, this order will expire on the making of oral submissions or otherwise on the 17th of December 2014. Yes, I'll make uh, both of those orders uh, in the terms sought. Mr Beckett, with that addition with respect to the expiration of the <coughs> of the um, non-publication direction. As your own please. And those directions back. Nothing further. No, nothing further. All right. Thank you. We'll otherwise adjourn. All stand.